right, Matthew, you can unmute and I'll turn it over to you. Hello and welcome back everyone to another in Realogy's Brokerage Expert Series. Thank you for joining us again today. My name is Matthew Ferrara and today we have a really wonderful conversation focused on the market dynamics that are driving the luxury real estate market today. We appreciate you spending your time with us as always. For many of you who have uh, been on these sessions before, you know that we try to bring you amazing guests who have both uh, great insights and experience into the topics at hand, but we also, while we want to hear from them, we also invite you to ask questions as we go through the session. And we do uh, see all of your questions and I will do my best to work them into the conversation with our guests because we want this to be interactive. So be sure to use the Q&A session. Also, we do record the session so you have a second or third or fourth chance to watch them again and share them with anybody that you uh, think should have been on watching and listening and learning from our guests. And uh, if they did get a chance, the recordings are also made available to you. And last but not least, we'll remind you at the end to just do our little survey to let us know any ways in which we can continue to improve, but also topics and things that might be interesting for you in the future. Now, we've been doing these all year, and we certainly have had some amazing topics so far. I think today is going to be absolutely no different. Uh, my two guests are really great friends of mine and people I have tremendous respect for. They are leaders in this space, and they uh, have such a breadth of knowledge and insight that I think you should get ready with a pen and paper to take lots and lots of notes and you also should get ready to ask lots and lots of questions. So uh, let's get going because we always run out of time in these conversations. It's just so much fun with all of our guests. I'm going to just do quick introductions and then we're going to start talking about the really amazing and, and powerful dynamics that are affecting uh, luxury real estate here today. So let me start by introducing you to, uh, to Diane Hartley. Diane is the president president of the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing. And uh, she has had more than two decades of experience in this space, uh, growing businesses, and of course, growing the uh, memberships, uh, ability to help uh, influence and uh, guide the luxury real estate industry. Uh, Diane ha works with a variety of uh, wonderful staff at the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing to really enhance the ability of luxury real estate professionals to engage today's modern consumers and, of course, to create growth in the exciting segment of high net worth individual clientele and luxury real estate. She um, she is actually uh, uh, based in Dallas and has, uh, uh, has been there for a while and has held other positions in the past. She worked uh, with uh, Travis Wolf, which was a CPA and consulting firm before that, and also served in many senior level management roles before, including the Dallas Morning News uh, and uh, the publisher of uh, Neighbors Go, which was a local social media website for Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, she is also a sales leader responsible for having launched uh, a Lux magazine, which was, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, obviously not just one of many forays into this, this uh, industry. And prior to being at the Dallas Morning News, she also was general management and sales management positions at a number of telecom, media, and publishing companies. She's also a very active member in many nonprofits in her, uh, in her town, most notably the Junior Achievement of Dallas where she is on the board of directors. So we're super excited to have her with us. Equally so, Philip White, uh, who many of you know is the president and chief executive officer of uh, Sotheby's International Realty. And uh, Philip is no stranger to this uh, industry. He has uh, 39 plus years in, uh, in this business. And he's, uh, as president and chief executive officer, he now oversees um, you know, the world's largest uh, luxury uh, affiliate network and company-owned brokerages in this space. In fact, under his leadership, Sotheby's in 2018 had grown to well over $112 billion in sales volume, which was the highest actual performance for the brand's history. And before that, he had uh, um, actually been in a, new, a number of roles at Sotheby's. Uh, before becoming president and CEO, he also had uh, responsibilities at the company-owned brokerages, uh, where he drove uh, affiliate network. Uh, excuse me, where he drove uh, growth there, and then, of course, 
uh, took over the affiliate side and drove growth um, worldwide. In fact, 72 countries, 990 plus offices and more than 22,000 sales associates affiliated with Sotheby's. Prior to that, uh, Philip had uh, actually owned his own uh, luxury firm in the 80s in Atlanta and had also uh, uh, worked with a number of uh, brokerages in New York and Palm Beach over his career, and he got his degree in commerce and finance from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So good to have Philip with us here as well. And as I said, you know, there's no doubt that both of you have tremendous reach of your knowledge and insights. You hear from the brokers that you work with, all sorts of you know, real world stories. So in addition to the big trends and the data, which I know you're all consuming all the time and digesting, you get that sort of boots on the ground aspect to this uh, very fun and sophisticated and sometimes complicated business as well. So let's just jump right in, give our audience some opening thoughts and then invite them, of course, at any time to ask questions. Let me just start with you, Diane, for just a second. Tell us sort of in the big picture, what from your members you're hearing are the you know, big things happening in the luxury real estate segment today. What are the, what are the big trends that come to mind uh, from uh, the stories and also the data that you get to see? Sure. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for the introduction. And thanks everyone for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, this is something that I think we've all been doing is appearing on uh, lots and lots of webinars and meeting people virtually, uh, which I think is the biggest change um, in, in what's really happening. You know, luxury real estate means something different in every market you're in. And the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing really covers all of North America, from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to, you know, Toronto, down to Naples. They all have luxury uh, in these markets. And what we've found in talking to our members, uh, obviously March was a different month than April which was a different month than May, June, and, and now here we are at the end of July. Does anybody wonder where July went? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, what we're hearing is it, it's, it's strong. It's somewhat surprisingly strong. Um, I was talking with one of my members this week and, and in a very strong market. This person's in a really strong market and she said it's, it's like we had a, like a European three-week vacation right? Like how Europe just goes away for a few weeks. And we got really smart about how to do this and came back and started showing homes differently, uh, talking to our clients a little differently, setting different expectations. And now we emerge in this surprisingly strong July um, that had some pent up demand, but really seems that demand just seems to be now normal. Um, so yeah, and I've got you know all kinds of stories from around the country about that. So that's good news. I mean, it's great to you know hear some positive news and also sure. the the relative strength of the industry. Now, Philip, your purview is global in terms of uh, the brokers and the the business, and so certainly while uh, we might expect that some areas have had some bumps, you know, in, in the same way that Diane uh, uh, mentioned, uh, tell us what you're hearing and seeing in terms of this segment uh, on a much bigger scale. Yeah, well, let, let me just, uh, you know, Sotheby's International Realty with our, our footprint, you know, really, particularly in the U.S. is kind of a proxy for the luxury market because um, we're in every major metropolitan area and, uh, you know, in many cases, we're the number one broker. So we're very proud of that. But just the backdrop going into to the pandemic. So Q4 2019 was a very strong quarter. Um, for real estate in general, it was a particularly good quarter for the luxury end of it. Q1 2020 was even better. So mm -hmm. Sotheby's International Realty, uh, it's not a commercial here for Sotheby's, but we were up 20% in Q1 versus Q1 2019. That's a big number um, and certainly outstripped, you know, the overall NAR number for that quarter. So we felt very good. I was, you know, excited about, you know, I think that was probably the best quarter we've ever had. So I was, I was very excited about, you know, the year ahead. Um, and then the pandemic came around the end of, of March um, and we started working from home. Um, and as Diane said, we took a bit of a, a break from the, from the action because we were all working from home and, and learning how to do some new skills. Um, so, 
But I think we can uh, attest to the fact that really middle of April was the, the basically the trough in the market. Um, and so when, when the, the economy started reopening um, and, you know, real estate was deemed an essential service in a lot of places, uh, we were able to start showing houses again. Um, and, we're, and we were out able to, you know, do some open houses, even though we were doing a lot of them virtually. So, uh, so really April, you know, we started seeing the market coming back in May. Um, you know, not so much the closings because the opens weren't there in April. Uh, but, you know, we certainly started seeing strong opens uh, in May and in, in, in very strong in June. And as Diane said, I mean, you know, July, you know, basically, you know, for particularly, uh, you know, uh, the franchise side of Sotheby's and, you know, I see daily numbers from both that business. I see daily numbers from our company owned operation where we're in 12 markets um, and really all those 12 markets um, are just are outperforming last year um, except Manhattan. Um, yep. So, you know, I was in Manhattan yesterday, so, but we're showing expensive properties there too. Um, but all the other markets for the most part are up and up in some cases, double digits in some cases, triple digits. Um, so, so yeah. Well, let me ask a question to both of you here. Cause when we say up, right. I, I'm curious as to, are we up dollar wise? Are we up volume wise? Both in some cases, you know, we, we, we start to hear this really optimistic news about these markets being up. And I think it helps our viewers to understand just where that momentum is because from a lot of the data that that I've seen, and I, and I don't have even, a, you know, a tenth of what what either of you would have, buyer interest is amazing right now. Buyers are strongly engaged mm -hmm. in this segment, in the luxury segment, whatever that price point is in some cities, but basically in that segment. And so I'm I'm wondering, are you seeing um, strength in terms of multiple offers? Are you seeing strength in terms of the uh, moving the average price point, you know, how can we qualify that a little bit for our viewers? You want to go, Diane? No, you go. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're seeing that in, across the board. I mean, I've got a lot of anecdotes. I mean, you know, the Hamptons, we've got agents that are working 24 <laughs> seven. Um, you know, they're getting six, eight offers on properties. I think you made a very good point, Matt, which is, you know, we're really dealing with serious buyers here because, right. Right. you know, the, in some markets, the inventory is getting depleted. So uh, they're feeling a real need to make a decision. So they're not going out looking at properties just to, you know, kick the tires here. So they're very serious. Um, you know, I was talking to our manager for Malibu uh, Pacific Palisades. You know, Malibu, we have one agent. This is kind of amazing to me. In the last couple of months, has done seven million dollars in leases. Yeah. Just think about that for a wow. minute. That's fantastic. I mean, how can you think? You know, you would think that it would be the opposite. In fact, during the last, what we've experienced in the last mm -hmm. half a year, and that the season. Yeah, and I, I think so I think what we're going to start to see it hasn't started becoming a topic yet, but mm -hmm. I think some of the buyer activity in these you know, let's call them somewhat second home markets, you know, may also be uh, investors buying for rental purposes. So okay. do you we think, haven't do you started think seeing that yet, trend, but like, I'm yeah, seeing much, early signs yeah. of that. Okay. And do you think some of that, Philip, is driven by the high net worth individuals caution in other asset classes? I mean, real estate has always been a wonderful performer when other asset classes have been you know, you know, less attractive. We were kind of talking even before the program how, you know, when you look at the stock market and you see, you know, uh, you know, airlines uh, might be uh, down, but other like technologies are up, automobiles are up. So as people are thinking about, wow, where can I put as a high net worth individual, where can I put my assets? You know, do you think that that's creating more lease interest, you know, purchase for lease uh, reasons in luxury? Yeah, I mean, I think diversification, you know, is a key component, Matt, and I think that's what you're talking about. And I think, you know, underlying someone buying an investment property, 
you know, a resort, even a, you know, an expensive property is, you know, there's more demand for leasing. Um, right. Right. So, because, you know, there are some people that don't want to necessarily buy because, because they don't know when this is going to end. Um, you know, they have other issues with, you know, children in schools. Um, but their stories, you know, on, on the East Coast where, in Manhattan, where families may have their children in a private school in New York City, now they've gone maybe to another market and they're enrolling their children in another private school just as a backup. So, right. you know, this is a, you know, a very significant thing that's happening here. Yeah. So Diane, let me pick up on that with you because what Philip's really pointing to is in a lot of ways, significant consumer behavioral changes. You know, mm -hmm. we always, uh, you know, we, we always expect that uh, high net worth individuals have a certain uh, interest in, 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 in luxury property. But I, and I've heard you say this before, there's always this shift between needs and wants in, mm -hmm. in terms of when we move to the, to the luxury market space. And then now Philip's talking to us and saying like, well, there's also a different set of needs that are evolving as well uh, that aren't just wants. So what are you seeing for major consumer trends? Yeah. How are they changing either the kinds of properties they're looking at or what they're asking um, the sales professional to help them with? Has that started to evolve as well as they're changing up their mix of, uh, of interest in, in, in the segment? Well, you know, um, I, I think what we have to kind of do here is think about how how different the luxury market is, okay? Right. And how many markets exist within the phrase that we're calling luxury. So we track behavior beginning at what we, what, you know, the term of mass affluent, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm at that point in my life where I'm beginning to collect assets or the Henry's, right? Um, high, high earners, not yet not rich yet, okay? There's, <laughs> there's lots of folks that move around in, in, uh, in luxury. And Philip's talking about folks that are really in the upper echelon of the ultra high net worth. And their behavior is what I'll call opportunistic, okay? Um, we've seen a V, everybody has seen the V in the market. Um, I was trying to find a visual of, of how we track to, to compare the V because it, it very much looks like what occurred in, in call it the S&P 500, okay? Where people got the ultra high net worth recovered, uh, whatever it was that they lost, they were looking to diversify. I think that's really interesting, Philip, uh, to track how much of this is really people moving in for, you know, picking up homes to lease. I think that's the way one segment of this market is looking. The other segment, is that I have the money, okay? But I've now been in my house for four months. Right. And my house might be a, I mean, I live in Dallas, Texas. I don't live in New York City, right? Dallas, Texas, a million dollars buys you a lot of house. <laughs> um, but in if I'm in a million dollar home in Dallas and I don't have a pool mm -hmm. and I'm being straight up, I read this, I couldn't believe it. There are people selling their homes without a pool to buy a home with a pool because you can't get a pool built in Dallas right now. Right, right. And I think that stepping into this and looking at all segments, if, if you're in a place like Paradise Valley, okay, you might see that type of movement, um, mm -hmm. you know, amongst these, what I'll call a little bit of homogenized, everybody's the same, right? And they're all wealthy. So I think, I think that remains to be seen um, about how they're gonna move. Right now, they're all moving in the same way which is they want what they want and they're going to buy what they want. Right. Um, so let me ask both of you just to pick up on that for a second. Do you think some of the things that have happened just in terms of how people live, as Diane was saying, like they look at the amenities of their home, but also even how they work are having some big impacts on the luxury market. I was just last night reading uh, in the Wall Street Journal an article where they were talking to architects about how they might design future luxury properties differently. You know, maybe people want to have a private gym as opposed to a, a gym amenity in a high rise or smaller private pools and balconies as opposed to gathering places. Are we seeing any um, changes in the kinds of property or in the kinds of locations? What if I'm a, you know, an executive with a software firm that says, 
you can work from home now. Maybe uh, I even want to have two places that I could work from home from in this case. Philip, anything in that area you, that you're starting to see trends on? Yeah, Matt, I think what's happening is, you know, and, and we're still kind of four months into this. So I think right. people are still trying to get their heads around this, um, you know, but I think it's causing people to think about, okay, well, now I can live anywhere, you know, to some degree. Um, you know, I can go back if, you know, if I'm transplanted, I can go back to where I'm from. Uh, or, or what we hear is I can go work in a more cost effective state, you know, if I, if you're up in the Northeast, for instance, like I am, but, right. uh, so I think we're seeing, you know, some of that. Um, but you know, that's not clear because, you know, what if there's a vaccine and then, you know, we get these headquarters open back up and you need to come back to work. So, you know, so it's not crystal clear there. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, work habits, um, you know, I think, you know, you know, they're going to, you know, people are going to modify them. I mean, but at the same time, you know, me as an example, um, I uh, went into Manhattan yesterday to meet with three agents who I'm trying to recruit from another company. Um, I'm not going to tell you who they are, by the way, so don't ask. Um, um, but, you know, it was, you know, I just, it was a great thing to be able to be with them, yeah. and, right, you know, right. and I could, you know, I could do my thing. Um, you know, so, um, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure teams and zoom is going to really replace that. Um, yeah, so it, it, it could be that we're just sort of learning our, our way through this and follow the consumer a little bit, but then, as you said, you know, people might also relax at some point, uh, if there is a vaccine or there are better ways yeah. to live with the, 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 you know, the virus itself. Um, let me uh, do two things before we go to our next quick uh, thought here. I want to encourage the audience to ask lots of questions, please. We have two amazing uh, experienced professionals in this space. I know that, uh, you know, there's 200 something plus of you watching. I know you've got something to ask for sure. So please get them in early so we don't run out of time. Go right into the Q&A box and uh, let me know what you want uh, them to, to address for you. So, all right, so lots of going on in terms of the consumer, lots of going on in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, the marketplace actually remaining strong, buyer interest strong, et cetera. Let's talk for just a minute about the, um, the luxury home professional. So the brokers in the network, the brokers, the members of, of, of uh, the Institute, Diane, uh, how are you seeing them adapt? What kinds of interesting innovations are you recommending to them as well as learning from them? Because this is a very savvy uh, uh, broker, a very savvy real estate professional because their clients are very savvy as well. So what kind of interesting, exciting things? I mean, I know Zoom's probably one of them, but there's probably lots of others too that you're seeing and recommending to them. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, I like to say we're living in interesting times, right? Um, <laughs> we, what we did at the Institute very, very quickly to, from, a, from our member standpoint was we gave them an opportunity to immediately learn new things. And that three or four week period where it was how much, uh, nobody knew from day to day what was really going on. And the ones that that came out of it after that period and, all, and learned a lot of new skills around things and how to use their phone differently, what a gimbal is, right? Um, <laughs> you know, all kinds of new ways to walk through a home to show folks what the home is like. And people who didn't really like to be on camera were suddenly saying, it doesn't matter if I like it or not, I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And that, that idea, the biggest shift that I saw was, first of all, embracing that we don't know what's going on. The embracing of the uncertainty and saying, well, here's what I know today. I know today that I've got a great house here and I need to show it to people. And so how do I learn how to do that in a different way? That was really inspiring. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members on multiple webinars learning all about things that they didn't know anything about the week before. So that was the biggest thing that I saw. And this really ultra focus on what 
new trends were they seeing and how could they get in front of it mm -hmm. and be mm -hmm. the person who can talk about, you know, you have a house that has rooms. And before we were talking about, before you put it on the market, we might want to tear that wall down. Today, don't do that. Right. Because a house with rooms <laughs> is actually <laughs> kind of a cool house to sell right now, right? There's yeah. separate rooms for things. So that's Home what we're offices, seeing. Home offices. Like that. Yeah. A, Just a, a little private space. You know? little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, Philip, I know, I just know firsthand that the Sotheby's International Realty uh, brokers are super savvy. In addition to always adapting uh, to new technologies, you know, they've found creative ways to leverage their network, to find inventory amongst themselves. And, and mm -hmm. really, you know, what kind of cool uh, stories and, uh, and things are you hearing from your network? Yeah, well, Matt, you know, that I appreciate that. So, you know, I've got great web traffic stats and you know it's our q2 was the most traffic we've ever had on our site it was like 10 and a half million views yeah. people stayed on there 21 percent longer than they normally do you know wow. clearly they're at home you know some of it's you know entertainment i get yeah. that um but at the same time you know we can we do draw a lot of good information from that so uh you know 25 to 44 years old 46 percent of the viewers were in that Right at that age group, 65 plus was 40%. That's up. So we have, you know, we have uh, a little bit older demographic searching also. Um, you know, video traffic. You know, the, without a doubt, properties with video got reviewed 72% more than properties without a video. Wow. So we were fortunate. 2016, we embraced the Matterport technology, and we had virtual uh, 3D tours on our site. So that's been very helpful. I think that's going to be something that really emerges in a very significant way uh, going ask, forward. So yeah, let me ask you a follow up question on that, because we do have a question in the in the chat room on that. And and I and I was really intrigued by the breakdown and, that you just mentioned in terms of what groups are spending more time mm -hmm. on there. Do you think there is, you know, regardless of the COVID circumstance, do you think there, uh, we're still seeing that impact of generational shift in the luxury market? Like that's still playing out and maybe playing out even more in terms of urgency right now? You know, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I think one of, you know, there's certainly, as you know, there's gonna be, you know, there's, I think we're in this big wealth transfer Yes. You know, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to really, uh, you know, uh, manifest itself, I think. But the other one was, you know, millennial buyers uh, were kind of slow to pull the trigger and buy a house. You know, we were expecting it, you know, sooner. But I think, you know, as that demographic I just shared, I think we're starting to see more of that as well. Um, so maybe one of the net results will be, where they were willing to be a bit more transient, you know, I think maybe that could be shifting. Uh, and so that's a very significant number of buyers um, that, you know, could in fact, you know, be the ones that buy up some of these properties in the suburbs that have been languishing on the market in some suburban areas. So, yeah. So and then, and then the other question you had, Matt, was, and I think this has been very innovative of our agents, and I'm sure it's across the industry, but um, I'm seeing more and more kind of small networks being created. Um, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago, and it was a combination of, of our international affiliates and, and U.S. Uh, agents. And, um, you know, of course, I knew, I knew all of them for the most part, and I had Lars Anderson from Sweden, from Stockholm on. Now he's up, I just emailed with him this morning. Uh, he's up 25% year over year um, in, in Sweden, in Stockholm. Uh, but we had uh, one of our great brokers in, um, in, in Rome, in Tuscany actually, Diletta. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're networking amongst themselves, sharing best practices. Deletta said to me, and I, I know her quite well, and, and she said, you know, I feel more connected to our network than I ever have before. Um, you know, just with the, the video conferencing that she's able to do. Um, and so that was kind of telling to me. Um, and so even though, you know, and previously I have to get on an airplane, you know, to go to Italy to see her, but now I'm seeing her, you know, every, you know, 
you know, often um, mm-hmm. in talking about best practices about real estate. Um, you know, and I think that's, you know, I think that's a very good practice that I'm seeing. And that's one of the other, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the other suggestions I have for people is if you're part of a network or you're part of a brand or you're, you know, have a good company, you know, really try to embrace, you know, the people that are in your network because there are a lot of referrals that can come out of that. We're seeing a lot of referrals now. Um, and you know, some, some significant referrals as well. So, you know, you know, one other thing that, that i have been hearing as well, based on what you were saying there, Philip is a lot of our members, you know, they, in the baby boomers, right? The, the 65 and older, they downsized and thought, okay, that's, that's it. That's where they're staying. And what they discovered in their coming back and calling them and saying, how's it going? You went from 8,000 feet to 2,000 feet. (laughs) Now you might not want to go back to 8,000 square feet, but how are you doing in this condo? And more often than not, there's some real interest in saying, you know, maybe I acted too fast. I want a little more space. Are you seeing that too, Philip? I am, you know, and I I think, uh, you know, and and also you have maybe those, that demographic there and, you know, and and there are times when some of their children are moving back. Right, Um, right. So that's uh, (laughs) kind of an unexpected thing that's happening. Um, you know, for whatever reason. So, um, you know, I don't think they were, those empty nesters were expecting that. So, yeah, I think space has become that ultra amenity in a lot of ways right now, right? Backyards. I I mean, I live in Las Vegas and some of the most beautiful properties here, you know, uh, are, are designed around indoor outdoor living, you know, in our weather as well. And I do think that people are, you know, looking at, um, uh, the segment and saying, I kind of like Diane's story a little earlier of like, well, you know, we, maybe we had the pool at the golf club, you know, that we would go to, but that's been closed for a while. And, uh, if this is a trend, maybe it is, you know, we might not need to build an Olympic pool, but we can't build one, uh, so we might have to buy one. So I do think that this amenity and generational, and also maybe a second round, as you say, like mm-hmm. coming back and reevaluating, we went from eight to yeah. two, maybe we'll just go back up to four. And you know, let me the ask other, a, the other me, thing that, ahead, that, that we're hearing is, is uh, I know when I turned 50, everybody said 50 or 50 is the new 30. And I said, okay. <laughs> and now they're saying space is the new luxury. Yes, right. right. So right. there were a lot of different new luxuries out there. And now it's these open spaces that people want, these, yeah. these ranches and mega mm-hmm. mansions on multiple acres that were just sitting are now getting a lot of movement. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, the, the time, that, that month period where people were sitting there thinking, what do I really want? And it turns out they want that. Places like Ada County, Idaho, or Kootenai County, Idaho, where Coeur d'Alene is, they're on fire. Uh, Whitefish, yeah. Montana, got a call from a member with a $10 million uh, person coming there, never met them. They had a $10 million budget and they wanted to spend it in Whitefish. Right. And so you think about that, that's a huge trend. So let me uh, get grab some of the questions that have flown into the chat room now, which is great. And obviously, uh, it means that our conversation is sparking some ideas. And uh, I, you know, all the ideas that we've said so far, I think, are, are um, uh, things that our viewers can can pick up on, especially the networking aspect of it for generating referrals. Uh, uh, you know, I just happen to think is such a wonderful opportunity with this technology to turn difficulty into new growth in that case. But two quick questions uh, in this area. Let me start um, one for you, Diane, which is, you know, uh, as you look at the trends that your members are reporting, they're taking advantage of the new things that they're trying, uh, virtual open houses, and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Philip uh, mentioned the use of things like Matterport and other great tools, and also other just broadly speaking trends and how you network with high net worth individuals. Do you feel as if there are some things that are trendy and will go by the wayside uh, when things, 
you know, go back to quote unquote normal? Or do you think that they, these are some things that high net worth consumers are, um, they want to be here to stay. They want to engage their brokers in a certain way. Uh, you know, as Philip said, their inventory that had videos significantly outperformed inventory that did not have videos. You know, do you think certain lines in the sand in terms of consumer expectations and the way in which we practice are going to be permanent? And do you think that some of these things are just sort of like stop gaps until, uh, I don't know, we, we get a sense that everything is like it used to be? Yeah, I mean, my natural inclination to answer that is that everything is cyclical. And I don't mean that to sound, you know, negative, but, but it is, right? It just, it's, it's this idea of being able to pick and choose what, what parts for you are important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we've got folks that are experiencing the best three month period in their careers. And these are, you know, high producing agents already. And so they're looking at, how can they embrace certain things that made them more efficient? Right. And when you know we get people reaching out to us, the biggest thing they want to get better at is time management mm. and being able to balance their their lives. Successful people look at work life balance, and one of the things that the pandemic has brought us all is we're a lot more efficient. And I think that while trendy right now, that I think for the the, the really successful folks is going to hold. Uh, how they interact in, in, with their clients, because their clients are changing. Um, yes. They're getting people coming into the fold of, of purchasing, as, as Philip was saying, that are millennials. I, I think about the East Bay of San Francisco, kind of a little quaint area that isn't Silicon Valley, and it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, not the city, but mm -hmm. it's this area that suddenly is hot because mm -hmm. the commute doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, will that change? We don't know. But those agents that are there are embracing every possible new thing. So that actually connects to a question I have for Philip, which uh, is uh, from one of our viewers here. And, and it kind of, uh, you know, if the commute doesn't matter anymore, right? So mm -hmm. even if it's for just a little while, and even if it's only for a small segment, of the population, you know, uh, and, and and it turns out they're in the luxury market. One of our viewers asked, you know, they're, they're, they're in Aspen, Colorado, right? So four years ago, they said everyone was, was thinking the new normal would be say $1,500 a square foot on average. And they've already gone way past that around $2,100 a square foot. Now, uh, do you think that these markets where things like the commute doesn't matter anymore, or I can live anywhere. So do you think that we, they could create some significant appreciation, some significant uh, price growth? Do you think uh, as our viewer asks, Quite, quite frankly, do you think it could hit $3,000 a square foot and be the new normal for somewhere like that? You know, my answer to that, you know, and I think that that's a good question. And, and that's something that I really do track, you know, being a luxury broker, you know, the, the metric I really do pay a lot of attention to is our average sales price. Uh, right. Right. You know, you know, what's happening to that. And, you know, I draw some correlation with 2008 and, you know, the financial crisis. I, I know that not everybody on this call was, you know, had to go through that. But, you know, what was interesting about that is, and I think it was a little unexpected, uh, it makes very good sense in hindsight, but the luxury end of the market led us out of that real estate recession, basically. Right, right. Because the 100% mortgages were, were lower priced properties and they got hammered. Um, so, you know, so they, you know, the, you know, the, the, the wealthier buyer stepped in and, and, and let us out. I expected that to happen here, um, you know, and um, I think the big, big difference is the inventory levels. So uh, we're in 08, we had a, you know, a, you know, in some cases an 18 month supply of houses. So, right. uh, and in some kind of any markets even greater than that. So, um, you know, but what's happened here with inventory levels being so low and then interest rates being so low um, that, the, you know, the lower price properties are getting snapped up quickly. Yeah. Um, and I've just now really end of June, into July, started to see our average sales price going up. So okay. it's kind of what I expected. Um, it's just about, you know, a couple of months later than I was thinking. So I think, I think, 
you know, Matt, what that is, is supply and demand. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, in some markets, you know, when I talk to our brokers, our managers, you know, their biggest concern is the inventory. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, that's a big driver of the average sales price. So that's probably what I'm seeing right now uh, is, you know, that's what happens when you get six or eight bids. Uh, early in the pandemic, we were seeing that on, on expensive leases. Mm -hmm. So we were getting multiple bids on leases and they were, you know, s you know, going up pretty high on a, on a seasonal basis, like in the Hamptons or Malibu, you know, or Aspen, um, and markets like that. So, um, so whether uh, Aspen can get to 3000 a square <laughs> foot, you know, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I mean, I'm not a soothsayer. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, Aspen is one of the greatest markets in the world. Um, yeah. there's only one Aspen, um, and, uh, you know, people that want to go there, that's where they want to be. So I wouldn't so, rule it out. So let, let me just pick up on that for a second though, because I, you know, you bring up a really good point in terms of, yes, it's the supply and demand challenge. And we were already just in general, millions of homes behind in the housing industry in general, since the, the financial downturn, new construction, you know, uh, quite frankly, in many areas, new construction is in the middle to luxury uh, mm -hmm. price ranges in, in places that are quite surprising, you know, but even uh, the national average price of a home is in the threes. I mean, I, I think I saw NAR data that said the national average has reached 330 something recently, which for years we used to say, well, in the high twos uh, type of thing. So we're seeing like real estate as an asset class itself actually see this appreciation. But let me just, let's talk finance for just two minutes here. Talk to me, Philip, about the jumbo mortgage, because that's a surprise right now, I think. Yeah, so, so what happened, you know, going into the, you know, pandemic, um, really early on, jumbo loans were, you know, it, it was a little scary. Um, right, right. You know, so, but what happened was the Fed stepped in yeah. Yeah. and started buying mortgages. Um, and that was a little unexpected, um, but they did it very, very aggressively. Um, so that unlocked the debt markets. Uh, so I think, you know, Jerome Powell is a unsung hero here. Um, Absolutely. You know, so uh, he stabilized that. Um, now banks, um, the ones that issue the loans, um, you know, they're having to, you know, reserve, you know, allowances for bad debt. Um, just, you know, because of uh, the unemployment, um, you know, numbers are scary. And, uh, you know, uh, defaults on mortgages, um, and so forth. Now, you know, so what they've done is they've raised credit standards, right. okay, for right. a jumbo borrower. Now, a jumbo loan uh, does not qualify under the CARES Act for any kind of forbearance as well. Um, right. So standards are higher, most likely your down payment is going to be higher. Um, and so, you know, and I, I, my guess is they're going to be tighter on appraisals as well. Um, just because they don't want to relive, you know, the, the sins of the past. Um, so you're going to have to have, you're going to have to be very credit worthy to get a jumbo mortgage. Um, you know, they're not going to count necessarily, you know, if you own, an, uh, you know, rental properties, they may, may not count your rental income because they can't count on your tenant paying you. Right. Um, right. So there are things like that that are happening. Um, That's a good point because it changes, the, really, really is rewriting the financial picture yeah. that we relied on for, for a long, long time. But, I, I, but, I wanted know, to make sure we got that A borrower who's credit worthy is going to be able to get a loan. Exactly. And, you know, even though I think rates may be up slightly, you know, from maybe a month or two ago, they're, they're still obviously very low. Yeah. Well, they're at, yeah, they're at an unforeseen, you know, I don't think at any point in yeah. history have we seen. Yeah, rates. what has happened though, is they are higher now than conforming loans, where, yes. where like yes. two months ago, that was not actually the case. Yes, yeah. 
Well, you know, again, uh, uh, I guess unprecedented uh, for the brokerage community and also for the Fed a little bit too. But but thankfully, it seems like they're making some smart interventions. Uh, uh, they've learned an awful lot um, yeah, since Matt, the last time. If, if Diane, I could take a minute and talk about inventory. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say. Yeah, and how yeah, this you track drives. a lot of inventory. Yeah, so um, about... 30 months ago, the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing set out to create an index for the luxury market. Because frankly, I would get the question, how's the luxury market doing? <laughs> and the answer was always what it's doing in that neck of the, that, the, that person's neighborhood. And, and Philip, you know, Philip knows that, that Sotheby's is a proxy, right? The data that, that because that's a proxy for the luxury market uh, because of the, the clientele that Sotheby's has. What we set out to do was across 90 markets, we set a luxury threshold. Mm -hmm. So Case Schiller will track homes across all levels, right? We said in these 90 markets or so that are considered luxury markets in North America, what's the threshold and we'll track everything above that. Now, I don't wanna go deep into the data because that's kind of boring when there's not visuals, but what I will say to everyone on the call is, I, I put together a landing page for you all to go download the last four, and we don't do this on our site. We, we take down the, the last months and put up this month's, but for this call, because we were talking about it, and the folks that are on the call, I think you'd be interested in watching March, April, May, and June. And we reported on all of them and how these 90 markets moved as an index and we moved from being in a balanced market as a whole in the single family homes above the luxury threshold into went balanced to buyers and we're now in a seller's market for, uh, for the single family homes. The flip side of that is they, the uh, attached homes stayed right. as a, they're, they're still buyers, right? Because mm -hmm. that movement that occurred Mm -hmm. Sometimes people getting out and moving into the single family. So I would encourage you all to go to the to go to the page. We're going to put that link out for them, uh, so yeah. you can see that link. There it is. It's in the chat room. Yep. Please go to that page that Diane specially configured for our session here today. Thank you for that. We Absolutely. really appreciate it. It's very very interesting data. And you know, here's the thing about that data. I think it just goes to show that we're in a position uh, as, a, as a brokerage community, as an industry now, to really provide insights to both the buyers and the sellers who, amongst other uncertainties that are happening, you know, in COVID period, but also just in the economy in general, you know, really need us to know our stuff, really need us to know our, our data, know our trends, and also to help them move from uncertainty to, to calculated risk, right? Which is what we do in this business, smart calculated opportunities um, for growth. Okay, we have about 12 minutes and we have a bunch of questions. I wanna try and get to them because we really wanna, you know, honor our viewers with uh, some, some getting their questions in there. And I know how much um, good stuff um, is still, you know, that you could share with us. So I'm going to do a couple of rapid ones with uh, you, if you could, uh, for me. I want to go to Philip real quick. Great question in here about like, okay, connecting, using the technology, you know, during this time, Zoom, things like that. Uh, always a good way to help us, you know, stay going and uh, uh, grow our business. But Talk about how, because it's so important to an organization like Sotheby's, uh, talk about how uh, you, you are using the technology, but also maybe doing other things to help strengthen the culture and leverage the culture at the organization to uh, continue to you know, create growth and to keep people you know, optimistic and, and positive during this time. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that was kind of my focus going into this was to try to keep people positive because they were scared to death. Right. Um, and, you know, I've lived through a number of crises. So, you know, I tried to keep them positive, share some of my stories with them on what happened in the past, you know, kind of what I thought was going to happen, um, you know, not obviously knowing clearly, but we used, uh, you know, uh, you know, the teams, um, you know, the, and, and we had, you know, our, some of our first town hall meetings. Uh, we had our first town hall with all of our agents were invited. Um, you know, we had thousands of agents call in. And then what I think we've done on the culture side, Matt, 
is that we've had, you know, agents and broker panels, uh, you know, and I, I know many of the brands have done that. We, you know, we did that early on, uh, you know, sharing best practices. Uh, it was, you know, we obviously recorded it and, and distributed it that way, but that, those were very positive, you know, things and, you know, back to, you know, sharing referrals, but, you know, that was, you know, I think kind of part of the culture at Sotheby's. We've, we've always been able to share with one another and, um, you know, because, you know, it, it, it's, you know, we, we're, we're still a, you know, a kind of a boutique feeling brand, if you will. And so we've always wanted to try to share with one another. So we, we set up teams in Zoom um, and coordinated that, rehearsed that, uh, brought in speakers from the outside, you know, to talk about new technology, whether it was Facebook Live or anything like that. Um, so, you know, we, and then we talk, and then we started giving uh, virtual listing presentation classes mm. uh, on how to conduct a virtual listing presentation. Um, so, you know, those were some of the things we did to continue the, you know, reinforcing the, the strength of our network. Cool stuff. All, all good stuff. Diane, I want to give a question over to you uh, from one of our viewers, which said, you know, in the past, uh, downsizers, you know, maybe took their time looking for their next place. And, uh, you know, now it looks like people might be either making decisions faster because they're just evaluating where they want to go. And maybe, you know, the pandemic uh, causes people to just take action in their yeah. lives, but also because the market, right, the market, if there are multiple priced offers, uh, uh, multiple overpriced offers on things, you know, they have to make faster decisions. Any thoughts on this being a, a trend? Do we think that perhaps, and, and Philip had mentioned it earlier, that that great transfer of wealth from one generation yeah. to the next uh, will be on an acceleration curve regardless of COVID or non-COVID? Well, I think, I think we've been given the gift of positive news on the news, right? <laughs> right. I mean, when you really think about what the news is reporting on, it's talking about the housing market as being, you know, kind of immune to what's happening here. And that can tend to force people to rethink priorities and want to move a little bit quicker. I think, I think as much as we'd all want a crystal ball, I think um, what I would say on will something stay a trend, I think as long as you're looking at it and looking for the data that supports it, and being able to shift and pivot if the data no longer supports that. That's what, what I think clients want from uh, real estate professionals. They want, they want the real estate professional to be the expert and to be ahead of this so, um, so they're not you know, buying into a downward trend. Makes sense. All right, so we've got about six minutes before the end here. Again, I wanna thank everyone for all their questions. Really appreciate it. I'm going to um, just ask a sort of wrap up style question here and get both of you to give us, uh, you know, not in Diane's sense, a sort of crystal ball, but maybe some best recommendations for staying strong in a segment that is strong and to be part of that good news. Uh, you know, how would our viewers, you know, if they were to uh, maybe take one smart action or to pursue one of the suggestions you've already made in our session here today, where would you point them in terms of where opportunity is and how to be part of that opportunity? But let's keep it easy just for the rest of the year. You know, let's, let's yeah. uh, you know, make the second half really, really strong. Diane, let me ask you to kick us off and then sure. Philip, I'll give you the closing word on this. Sure. I think, I think a, a great practice is to always know when you're popular. Okay. <laughs> and right now you're really popular. Lots of folks want to hear from you about what's occurring. Um, I like to say that I'm old enough to have experienced the stock option craze. It's no longer the cocktail party talks to talk about that. It's talking about the value of your home. So right. be that person, not just in your local market, but also your feeder markets. Okay, cool. Awesome. So be know when your time is, is, yes. is, is to be, <laughs> and it's now <laughs> is to be a, a celebrity and it's now. And, yep. and obviously I like what you also said earlier, which is the good news is that the real yep. estate industry is the good news. Yes. And so, and that's a cool thing. And, and I think we've long discovered that real estate is America's real pastime with all due respect to baseball, right? People love to talk they real do. estate. That is true. Philip, where would you uh, point all of our viewers to continue their 
not only a strong mindset, but a growth opportunity uh, for, uh, for the rest of the year. Yeah, I mean, what I would talk about is, you know, number one, you know, trying to trying to stay healthy, you know, both both physically, you know, try to stay, you know, mentally positive. Um, you know, I, I think this is a trying time for some agents, but, you know, particularly maybe the ones that don't have a lot of experience, um, don't have a real strong sphere of influence or past customers. So I think, you know, I think as managers, you know, we need to be aware that, you know, those agents need help. Um, so the more we can, you know, reach out to them, the better, uh, and give them some simple best practices. Um, you know, I think the simplest one, I know it's the, probably the oldest one is to reach out to your past customers. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I know many of you in the industry, you know, if you saw surveys, you know, of, of, of a, from a, you know, a, a seller or a buyer, did their agent call them after the closing? Okay. They, you'd be shocked at how many times they did not do that. Um, in some cases it was up to 50%. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, that is a great resource that you have past customers, you know, reach out to them. I've, I've heard stories about someone that did that. The person was surprised because they bought the house four years ago and they'd never heard from the agent. So it was a little embarrassing, you know, but they, you know, made the call anyway and, and reconnected. So I think, you know, those kind of things are really important. Now with a newer agent, they're going to have to figure out how to, you know, you know, mentor with someone, you know, try to connect, talk to their manager, try to connect with an, you know, more of an established agent. Um, because I think, you know, I worry about them uh, in this virtual environment, um, you know, being left behind. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that's, you know, we need to focus on, you know, some training, um, and, you know, and, you know, training for, for those agents. Yeah. I love that. Well, both awesome. Um, recommendations for us right so you know no one people need you as diane says they they're looking to us for insights and tap into your relationships right tap as, as philip says the relationships you have with your clients your sphere of influence past and present and also your networks whether it is as a member of the institute or whether it is as a member of a brand or a network or just a member of the realtor family in a lot of ways right because there's a lot of us and we take strength um, from each other. So I want to thank both of you for your insights, your wisdom, your optimism. Uh, I think I, I'm just looking at comments in the chat room and the things that are in the Q&A area. Really, people have enjoyed this session. So thank you both very, very much. I want to remind everybody that there is a link to fill out a little survey before you go. Please let us know what you like, what you want more of, and how we can help in any way. Uh, and again, uh, Diane Hartley, Institute for Luxury Home Marketing. Philip White, President and CEO of Sotheby's International Realty. A pleasure always. Just good to see you, my friends. Always learn something from you, and thanks for sharing with our viewers. On behalf of Realogy and the Brokerage Expert Series, I'm Matthew Ferrara. Thanks for joining us once again. Please be with us next month. Mark your calendar. Sign up early. Tell a friend. We've got plenty of seats, and we'd love to have them join you and join us again. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, my Diane. Pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, Diane and, and uh, Philip. We really appreciate it. Great job. Great session, Matthew. Great job as always. Thank you. And uh, we will get a link out to everybody if they want a copy of it to send out. Uh, we'll get that out to you uh, later today. My pleasure. Super fun session. You guys were awesome. Questions. They loved it. Comments in the chat room. I don't know if you saw them, but they really enjoyed it. So bravo. I've got to run. I've got 60 seconds to be on another show. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks really so appreciate much. it.